The first great protest march on the nation's capital ever was for the right to vote for women. In 1913, the day before the presidential inauguration, 5,000 women marched down Pennsylvania Avenue. It took pushing and pushing and pushing. It took hunger strikes, picketing in front of the White House, all this creative, nonviolent protest that was new to this country. This was before Gandhi had done a lot of these things, but the women's movement and the fight for women's suffrage introduced them to the United States. We get to the 19th Amendment that guarantees women the right to vote. When you look back at how long women fought for the right to vote, we're used to movements now 10 or 20 years and the change happens. Women spent their entire lifetimes fighting for the 19th Amendment. Black women were instrumental in the passage of the 19th Amendment. And they had been part of this conversation from its beginning. Women who were helping shape opportunity for white women and for black men. And yet in each of these conversations, black women were left out of the narrative. And then post reconstruction, black men who had suddenly become part of the body politic were once again disenfranchised. The greatest moments of progress are followed by the most intense periods of retrenchment. That's what happened after the Civil War. Reconstruction was a high point for voting rights, and it was followed by nearly 100 years of Jim Crow. And the decision to remove the troops from the South was a decision made by one vote in the Congress. One vote put an end to Reconstruction and started the era of violence and bloodshed and Klan-led catastrophes. The South was trying to figure out, how do we stop all of these Black folk from voting? If they continue to vote, we're in trouble. How do you say we don't want Black folks to vote? without writing a law saying, we don't want black folks to vote. Mississippi said, oh, we've got this. We have figured out how to get around the 15th Amendment while systematically denying the vote to African Americans. And that was the Mississippi Plan of 1890. What Mississippi came up with was, we are going to use the societally imposed conditions on African Americans and make those conditions the access to the ballot box. What you say is democracy is expensive. Elections are expensive. And if you're really invested, you should be willing to pay a small fee. A poll tax, it's not too much. It sounds so reasonable. But when you begin to think about what that means, you can pay for food or you can vote. You can pay for some clothes for your children or you can vote. And then the literacy test. The literacy tests are misnamed in a sense because they weren't really tests of one's literacy. They were traps. They were designed to never let you be able to answer them correctly. I actually took out one of the old literacy tests from Alabama. My class of second and third year law students could not pass the literacy test. There were literacy tests, poll taxes, grandfather clauses, all white primaries, property clauses. If this one doesn't get you, this one will. If this one doesn't get you, this one will. There were this raft of different laws that were called the Black Codes. 
and those laws criminalized basic normal behavior. It was a crime to be on a city street without having a place to go. It was a crime not to have a job, even if what you were doing was looking for work. If you were caught loitering, meaning you were waiting for your wife in a store, that could be a pretext for arresting you, incarcerating you, and permanently disenfranchising you. That felony disfranchisement coming out of Florida in 1868, what that does is it strips you of your right to vote. It is a way to, to neutralize the 15th Amendment. Virtually overnight, African Americans are eliminated from the electorate in the South. So you go from having black governors and senators to having almost no, if not any, black voters that were able to participate in elections. In Mississippi, during Reconstruction, African American voter registration was almost 67%. By the time we have fought the Nazis and we are moving into the Cold War, where the U.S. is really holding up as the leader of the free world, only 3% of age-eligible African Americans were registered to vote in the South. 